First Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6, it says, These things, brethren, I have in a figure, metaphorically, transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you might learn, underscore this statement, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. Just that statement, above that which is written. We can only teach what is written. Yeah. There are some things we conjecture, we guess, we hypothecate, we try to make this fit into that and that fit into this. This past week with the eclipse and so forth, there's a lot of potential prophetic meaning in that. I saw one post that said, it's time to stone all of the false prophets. <laughs> well, it may be if somebody went, if somebody went beyond what is scriptural, then go ahead. But you can't stone anybody yet because nobody said that on the day of the eclipse, this, this, and this are going to happen. The eclipse in Nineveh happened 40 days, if this is correct, 40 days before Yom Kippur, and there never was anything happen. Why? Because everybody repented and God relented whatever it was that was designed in Jonah's prophecy. So just because something does or does not happen doesn't mean that it's a false prophecy and most of this is not prophecy to start with it's just does this mean this could this possibly mean that and that's the way I've addressed all of this last Sunday morning I preached on that and that was the day before the eclipse and the eclipse was just what here in the Ozarks it was just a little shading that took place the shadows became more defined and so that didn't mean anything I did say last Sunday if you remember me what does the eclipse mean to us? It means that we ought to praise God because God has everything, every solar and lunar crisscrossing of events that happens every certain number of years. He's got it all in control. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth forth his handiwork. But then the next verse says, day unto day uttereth knowledge and night unto night uttereth speech. So the heavens do give us knowledge. They teach us things and they do speak to us and they speak especially to lost people to try to wake people up. And so last Sunday we talked about don't be twisted. That means what? Don't twist scripture to try to make it think what you want it to think. If it does mean certain things that this number means that and this sun and moon and stars mean certain things, well, we have to be wise to that as well. Don't just say that everybody that tries to teach something prophetically with symbolism that they're wrong. They may be. <laughs> That's where your wisdom and your own walk with the Lord comes into play. So what do he say there? Not to think of men above that which is written. No matter who it is, how well versed they are, how big of a celebrity they are, how big of conventions they speak at, how many books they've written, how many degrees behind their name, that means nothing. Don't think of men above that which is written. Know what's written. Know what's in the book. So Sunday we said don't be twisted. Keep your theology straight. Don't be terrified because there's nothing that ought to scare a child of God who knows his name's written in the Lamb's book of life. Don't be timid because this is an hour for you to stand up and preach and be counted for God. Don't be tepid, which means lukewarm. You know, stay on fire. And don't be tupid. Everybody say, don't be tupid. Because we need to know what's in the Word. If we're ignorant because we have failed to study the Word of God, then that's our fault. Amen. You say, I don't understand it. Well, that doesn't hold water. Get into the book and let God speak to you because he will speak to you. Don't be stupid and then don't be torn. Don't let the world pull you. Stay faithful to God. And then the last thing was don't be uh, trapped because as a snare it shall come upon everyone that dwells on the face of the whole world. Hallelujah. Let's go to our second page. We ended up last week talking about Armageddon. Armageddon is the final war, world war. It is a world war. It's not a regional conflict. The whole world's being pulled into it. And now Revelation 16 and 16 uses the exact term Armageddon. In fact, that's the only place in the Bible that it is used. It is the battle to end all battles, and Jesus Christ comes back in that battle. One thing I want you to look up is in Revelation chapter 14, when the seventh angel comes to play, a sickle is drawn to harvest 
the grapes of wrath, and that grapes of wrath is a word that you've heard. This is where it comes from. Verse 18, another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and he cried to him that had the sharp sickle, which is the Lord, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. There is a true vine, and there is a vine of the earth. The true vine is what? That's the people that are going home to be with the Lord. That's the church, the true vine. But there's the flip side of that, the vine of the earth. The vine that is rooted not in the Bible, but is rooted in this earth and what this earth has. For her grapes are fully ripe. Verse 19, And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. A winepress is a place where you get in with bare feet and you stop. This is the trampling of the judgment of God. Verse 20 is a verse I want to read because a lot of people take this literally. I don't, you, you might be able to. And the winepress was trodden without the city, that's Jerusalem, and blood came out of the winepress, even under the horse bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. And that comes out somewhere around 200 miles. And the fact that it says 1600, some have interpreted that to mean that it's something that's to be divided by four. If it is, this comes out at a geographic area about the size of Israel, but that doesn't tell us that we're to interpret it that way. If it's it's 200 miles long, then when Jesus comes and touches down and that ground cleaves that we talked about last week, it may leave a place a couple hundred miles long where blood actually would be to the bridles of the horses. But to think of a geographic area of 1,600 furlongs would basically be impossible to have that up to the bridles. That would be a huge tsunami for that to happen. But anyway, I think it's just something that's to be read metaphorically. Man, the blood's going to be to the bridles. Whether that's an actual thing or if that's just a symbolism, you don't need to try to take that literally if you don't want to take that literally. Because you're going to hear preachers say the blood's going to run to the bridles. How many of you ever heard that said? Is it going to run to the bridles? Perhaps, if, like I said, if there is a crevice that would allow that, okay? Anyway, that's what happens at Armageddon. Chapter 19, let's wrap up our Armageddon teaching with the actual coming of the Lord. It says in verse 11, I saw heaven open, an appearing apocalypse. And behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. John saw the same thing in the first chapter of Revelation. And on his head were many crowns. This is Jesus because it declares that he is the Word of God, the King of kings and Lord of lords. This is Jesus. Last time we saw him, he was riding on a colt, the foal of a donkey, right? Very humble. This time he's coming in absolute greatness and prestige and glory. White horse. So we saw a white horse in the sixth chapter, and following the white horse was a red horse and a black horse and a pale horse. So that white horse would have had to be a counterfeit, because here we see the true. And you're going to find some prophetic teachers that say that that white horse in Revelation 6 is Jesus. It's not. It's a false Jesus. But here a white horse and he that sat upon him is faithful and true. In righteousness he judges and makes war. Yes, Jesus is a lamb of God, but he is also a lion of the tribe of Judah. And he is meek and mild and merciful, but he is also a God of holiness and righteousness and judgment. His eyes were as a flame of fire. They blindfolded Jesus last time he was on this earth. This time his eyes burn right through the blindfolds. And on his head were many crowns. The last time he had a crown of thorns on his head. This time he has royal diadems. Not thorns, but actual gold and diadems. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. That'll be interesting. So when we say don't go beyond what's written... How many of you know you can't come up with that name? Mm. Yeah, there's another place where it said, seal what the seven thunders said. Right. And I've heard preachers preach on what those seven thunders said. Is that right? When God said seal. <laughs> uh, and uh, he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. Here's the winepress of the wrath of God. Last time he had his own blood that soaked that garment. This time it's a garment dipped in blood. And his name is called Logos, the Word of God. 
and the armies which were in heaven followed him. So whatever's following comes from heaven, not from earth. So when we'll talk about the rapture at some point in this, but there's some coming with him. Armies, plural, followed him upon white horses. That would be both angels and man, because we'll study that at another point. Clothed in fine linen, white and clean. It said earlier in that chapter, verse 8, the fine linen, clean and white, is the righteousness of the saints. So saints are involved here. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And this is the setting up of the kingdom of Christ. And he treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And that ties into that 14th chapter that this is where blood's to the bridles in whatever sense that means. And he has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I've heard many people use that to defend tattoos. That doesn't say a thing about tattoos there. It may be tattooed on his leg, but the other part's on his vesture. And he is King of Kings, and that means what? He is the king of all sub-kings, and he is the Lord of all sub-lords, and we are kings and priests unto God. So we're coming with him. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourself together for the supper of the great God. And so this is what Armageddon is. It closes the war of all wars. And it ends not just man fighting man, but man fighting God and God coming back, Christ coming back to close and to seal up this present dispensation that we're in called the church age. Does everybody understand Armageddon? Let's move on to number 12 there. Ascension in our end time terminology. Ascension. Don't get confused between the resurrection and the ascension. A lot of people will use those interchangeably and they are not interchangeable. The resurrection happened on the Feast of First Fruits on a Sunday when Jesus rose out of the grave. He is risen. That could be stated as rising, it could be stated as resurrection, it cannot be stated as ascension. Ascension is what took place after 40 days when he showed himself alive on the behalf of apostles and so forth. And on that day, they saw him ascend into heaven in Acts chapter 1. So the verses that we have there, Luke 24 verse 50, go back there if you would. It's good to look these up. I haven't given you time to. But I love the way the book of Luke closes. He promises the power of the Holy Spirit will come. Wait in Jerusalem till you're endued with power from on high. And then in verse 50, he led them out as far as to Bethany. And he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. This was the parting, and if you'll flip over to Acts chapter 1, you'll see the time frame in which this happened. Because it says in verse 2 of Acts 1 that he showed himself alive by many infallible proofs. And here's a verse of scripture that many have not... Okay, verse 3, I need to continue that. Showed himself alive by many infallible proofs, listen to this, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. There were periodic and occasional appearances of Jesus Christ over a 40-day period where he communicated to them the things that they are to do to go back to Jerusalem and tarry until you're endued with power from on high and whatever he communicated to them about the kingdom and being assembled together with them commanded that they should not depart from Jerusalem but wait for the promise of the Father. And verse 6, they asked him, when shall you restore the kingdom? And he said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. We don't know the date of the rapture. We don't know when he's going to set up his kingdom. We don't know a lot of things. We can only take the preponderance of scripture and produce what is sound doctrine. You'll receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. He said that during 
40 days while he was communicating the kingdom to them. But look at verse 9. When he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, they say he went up, that's the ascension. Two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. We can't say that the millennial reign is just a time when the Holy Spirit is in charge. Jesus himself went visibly. Jesus himself will return visibly. Jesus went away personally. He will come again personally. He went away bodily. He will come again bodily in like manner as you've seen him go away. He went away victoriously. He will come back victoriously. So this is the ascension. When he said to Mary, I've not yet ascended to my father, that too was an ascension. But the quote ascension is what we're talking about here that happened for the last time went into the presence of God and has sat at the right hand of God ever since. People have seen him since, but positionally he's at the right hand of the Father now. Number 13, Babylon. And there's mystery Babylon. There is historical Babylon. Everybody say Babylon. Babylon. Or you can say Babylon. Or simply Babylon. Historical Babylon was when the Tower of Babel was built in the 11th chapter of Genesis. What happened there? After the flood... Nimrod had built a city called Babel. It's very interesting if you want to study Genesis chapter 11 that from Ararat where Noah and his family came out of the ark that you move down that mountain range and all of the first cities that we have able to historically document through carbon dating and cities that are present today that have started way, 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 way back they all started there coming down that mountainside from Ararat. That itself ought to prove the flood. You can't go into Missouri and say St. Louis dates back to 1,500 years after. So dates back to... 4,000 B.C.? Just throw out 4,000 B.C. Okay, we don't have anything like that. And you can go back into Aztec communities and Chinese communities and so forth, and you can date back close to that. But what happened? All of these primal cities start from the mountaintop and they work their way down farther and farther into the lowlands of Mesopotamia. Nimrod built one of the earlier cities there and he built a tower. What was the tower for? It would make sense that the tower was built to where if this ever happens again, the flood is not going to get me. That's basically what the Tower of Babel was. It was an attempt to unseat God from being able to do anything to stop human civilization. He was a hunter. That doesn't mean that he was a hunter. It means that Nimrod was a hunter of souls. He was a hunter of power and ambition. And he was the first type of the Antichrist. He was the first type of a one world totalitarian ruler. He was a dictator. God said, I'll show you whether I'm God or not. And he confounded the languages of the people. Well, from that day on, they're dispersed everywhere. And you now begin to find cities in all other areas of the globe. I mean, they traveled far and wide. And we now have different languages from different areas. And it all dates back to that. So that's historical Babylon. Then there's also mystery Babylon. And material Babylon. Go to the book of Revelation chapter 17 and you will see Babylon in two different pictures here. This is not chronological because we close chapter 16 with the battle of Armageddon. And then chapter 16 closes with Armageddon and chapter 19 moves into the coming of the Lord. So Armageddon ends in chapter 16 and chapter 19 merging together. 
chapter 17 and 18 are parenthetical. They are inserts. They're just thrown in there because they got to be placed somewhere, and you can't just put it into a timeline. Babylon is all the way through the history of the Bible, clear to the very end. You'll have a little bit of trouble with this. Everybody say Babel. Babel. So the city is Babylon. Babel. It wasn't originally called Babel or Babylon. It was called Babel after God judged them, and everybody started to Babel. So if you say that's a bunch of babble, where are you getting that word from? You're getting it from the original dividing of tongues. Mm -hmm. Babylon was destroyed on the day of Pentecost. It wasn't Pentecost then, but if you date back from the day of Pentecost, the dividing of tongues that created confusion happened on the same day that would be the day of Pentecost. God brought back what was confused at that day and brought it back under his Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost to where there was all of these languages that were spoken on the day of Pentecost that brought the whole world together. That caused the whole world to come apart in Nimrod's day. But when the Holy Spirit came, it brought all languages together through the Holy Spirit and made the church one. That's just a side note. Revelation chapter 17 is written about mystery Babylon, verse 5. This is a religious Babel or a mystical Babel. This is all about a religion and a world religion that is going to be present in the last day. Chapter 18 comes out and starts to talk about material Babylon. And so all of these Babels and Babylons are metaphorical. They are symbolic of different movements in the world. One is mystical. It is spiritual. It is controlled by Rome and controlled by world religion. Chapter 18, it talks about things like merchants of the earth. The merchants that look at the cities of Babel that's destroyed and cast down to the ground. Alas, Babylon the Great is destroyed. This is a material city. It talks in verse 11 about the merchandise of this city. Fine linen, purple, silk, scarlet, thyene wood, vessels of ivory, manners of precious woods, and so forth and so forth. This is all material and industrial. Whereas chapter 17 is all spiritual. So this would take a long time to teach this. So we're not going to do that today, but you can look up the different chapters and kind of get your own feel for it. I have never had a complete grasp of what these two chapters are talking about, except that one is spiritual and the other is material. There is a material Babylon that is going to be built. That city may already be built. Babylon, the city, is going to be the greatest economic overarching economic hub that's going to be amazingly powerful that's going to bring all the kings of the world to its opulence and to its glory. If you'll ever go to the Middle East and set your foot in Dubai or in lesser cities like Doha or Abu Dhabi, there are cities over there that eclipse anything that you've ever seen in the United States. They are absolutely unparalleled and amazing. The city of Dubai has, when I was there last, had 120 skyscrapers that had over 60 stories to them. There's nothing like that. There was a point where one third of all the cranes in the entire world were stationed in the city of Dubai. Dubai has a tower in it that is 160 stories high. I've stood at the base of it and looked up at it. It is utterly amazing what there is in the city of Dubai. Could Dubai be material Babylon that's going to fall into the sea? Possible. I don't know. But all of the other Islamic nations that have oil producing power want to build something. They're so competitive. Saudi Arabia right now is putting together something that is supposed to eclipse the city of Dubai out in the deserts of Saudi Arabia. They're already working on it. And so I don't know what Babylon is. But one of those cities in the Middle East is going to become the central economic hub of commerce for this world. I wanted to give you a little discussion on BRICS. Anybody heard of BRICS? Not Brexit. Brexit is uh, England. BRICS, B-R-I-C-S. The biggest developing economic force in the world, contrary to the United States. It has really blown up in the last four years. BRICS is Brazil, Russia, 
India, China, South Africa. Right. These five countries have come together and are developing a strategic powerhouse to counter the United States and the American dollar. We are helping China to become the most dominant force in the world, and they are getting very close to eclipsing the United States, and if they do, then the economies will not be built on the American dollar anymore. They will be built on the Chinese yen. And when that happens, America is going to go into free fall. Will that happen? According to Revelation chapter 18, there will be an economic change that is not built on the West. It will be built on the Middle East and whoever's a part of this. So since then, in January 1st of this year, United Arab Emirates, Iran, Ethiopia, and Egypt joined BRICS to make a nine-nation economic monstrosity. Brazil right now that started this, Brazil is so influenced by China right now that it is starting to give up its connection with the United States. That would be a horrible thing of South America. Brazil is the center of all the economics of South America. That whole continent could come under the influence of China. It already is. There are 15 other Middle Eastern nations that have applied for membership in BRICS. Anyway, we're sitting at nine right now. We've always saw the 10-nation confederacy as being European. It may be, but I have always had trouble figuring out how Europe could ever muster enough strength to pull off being the last day empire. They can't even fight off Hitler themselves. How are they going to be this crushing monolith that can leave everyone saying, who can do war with it? Whether BRICS is, once again, I can't go beyond what's written in the scriptures. We don't know. What, no, no, no. It is a world... What, what is the S? It is a world economic community of Brazil, Russia, India, China, China and South Africa, so, all of which are very, very, very strong. If you take England and the United States out of there, then you've just taken the top other five economies. And adding to that United Arab Emirates now, which is also... Israel and United Arab Emirates and France and Britain are the only four national economies that are in the top ten. All the rest of them are in BRICS. This is supremely dangerous to the United States economically. Number four, beast. The beast. We could deal with the beast today or we can deal with it next week. What do you want to? Number 14. You all want to look at the beast? Let's go to Revelation chapter 13. And there are three beasts noted in the book of Revelation. One is uh, the beast from the sea. The second is the beast from the earth. The third is a scarlet colored beast. The scarlet colored beast basically is the same beast as the beast in Revelation 13. It is just that the mystical Babylon called the harlot of Babylon rides upon this beast. In other words, this final religious one world religion and one world religious system gets its power and gets its influence and momentum and ability to operate because it hooks up with the beast system. You need to really watch religion when religion hooks up with a political system because it has always ended bad in every place that it's ever happened. We don't want the United States to governmentally be a Christian government as far as controlled by, quote, Christian individuals. If it was controlled by Jesus Christ, great. If it's just controlled by, quote, religious men, then we don't know what we're getting into. We want to always vote our conscience and vote people in that will further the kingdom of God and further the cause of Christ. But that doesn't always mean that that person is going to be a, quote, perfect Christian. It may be that God has set up this particular election for his purposes. So you need to be wise who you're voting for. If you have any confusion about that, Please see me after the close of the teaching. <laughs> so let's look at the top picture there, the graphic that we have. You know, you can go online and look up images and find all kinds of images. And uh, this is the best one that I've found. When you look up images of the beast from the earth, you'll find out that there's hardly none. There's maybe two out of the hundreds of thousands of things that Google or whatever your search engine tries to pull up. If you look at the beast of Revelation 13, it'll pull up any number of 
pictures that people have pictured, which means we put all of our emphasis on the beast from the sea, and we don't put any emphasis of the beast from the earth. And we're going to find out that the beast from the earth is not just a add-on or just a secondary, the false prophet. The false prophet is as important as the beast because Satan has tried to imitate the Trinity. Just as there is a Father, a Son, and a Holy Ghost, in Revelation chapter 12 there is a dragon, chapter 13 there is the beast, and then there is the false prophet. And the false prophet seeks to fulfill the same role that the Holy Spirit would fulfill because the false prophet does what? He aims all worship to the beast and he tries to glorify the beast and basically it's a satanic counterfeit. It's not a real trinity, it's a counterfeit trinity, but Satan himself has always wanted to take everything that belongs to God and make it himself. He has an insatiable burning hatred for God, but at the same time a desire to be God. Five times he said in Isaiah 14, I will, I will, I will sit on the sides of the north. I will be like the most high God. I will get the worship of the angels of God. And so that ambition is carried from the garden and from pre-creation all the way to the end of the book of Revelation. So let's look at this in Revelation 13, verse 1, a beast out of the sea. It says, I stood upon the sand of the sea. What sea? Well, sea there could not be dead sea. He's looking a long ways across an expanse. So this is the Mediterranean. So whatever this beast is, it rises up in the Mediterranean. I would interpret that to mean. We're not looking at the United States here. We're not looking at China. We're not looking at Brazil or South Africa. We're looking at the immediate area of the Middle East, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the names of blasphemy. So that's out of the sea. Keep your hand there and flip over to the 17th chapter and look at verse 8. The beast that you saw was and is not. We're looking at it not only being current, it is historical. It was, you can go back in the book of Daniel and find where it was, and is not, that it has disappeared for a time. And now it says, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. So whatever this system is, there was a time when it was here, there was a time it closed down, and now it's going to be revived and resurrected. So we have that. It comes out of the sea. It was and is not. And then in chapter 19 and verse 20, it says, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. So we see his, the end of this system. Go back to chapter 11 and verse 7. It says, when the two prophets, that we'll look at it at another point, when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. So back to chapter 13. Whatever this beast is, it rises out of the sea, but its power came out of the bottomless pit. It was, it was not, now it is. So that would be the revived Roman Empire that was, was not, and will be revived. But let's walk down through this, and with our picture there, try to picture what John was seeing. Is this something that is actually going to rise up out of the sea, and we're going to see on CNN someday? No, this is symbolism. The sea has to do with multitudes of people. This is symbolism, okay? What uh, he is referencing is in chapter 17 that it says that the sea is people and nations and tongues. Okay, that is chapter 17, verse 15. He saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, mystery Babylon, are peoples and multitudes and nations 
and tongues. When we say rising out of the sea, he is looking immediately at the Mediterranean Sea, but the sea with waves roaring are symbolic of numerous things in the Bible, one of which is the masses of people. So this has a twofold meaning here, that it does come from the masses, but it comes from the sea. The sea is what? Out and in, and out and in. It's unrest. The sea that can never rest, it says in Isaiah. This beast rises out of unrest. He rises in the Middle East, and he rises out of people, nations, kindreds, and tongues, which means that he could be from basically anywhere, but I believe this localizes him as being Middle Eastern in some way or dealing with the area of the Mediterranean Sea, which could also be European. If I really got specific, when Alexander the Great was defeated, his kingdom was broken up into four different sub-kings and that the Antichrist comes out of one of those kingdoms, which was the Syrian Empire. But I'm not going into that right now. It doesn't really apply right here. First of all, he rises up out of the sea, rises up. That could mean that he rises to power quickly. I think this is a picture of a quick rising. Whatever the Antichrist comes, he will come in the midst of turbulence and unrest and dysfunction and chaos, anarchy, and will rise up quickly out of the sea having seven heads. So obviously no man has seven heads. So this is, if you look at 14, number 14 in your study, there is a beast system and there is a beast person. A beast system and a beast person. If you talk about Babylon, you're talking about of old, you're talking about Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is Babylon. Babylon is Nebuchadnezzar. It's both an empire and the person that is seated on the empire. If you talk about the United States, you're not necessarily talking about Biden because Biden's an elected official. They're two separate things. If I talk about Russia right now, you immediately think Putin. Uh, not because Putin is Russia or Russia is Putin, but the system becomes the person, right? This beast is both a system, it is a governmental structure, it is a totalitarian state. If I say Nazi, who do you think of? In the Third Reich, that part of it, if I say Third Reich, what do you think? Hitler. If I say Hitler, what do you think? Third Reich. There's a system, but there's also a person. And that's the way it is with the beast system that is going to come. Was and was not and is. We'll talk about that at another point. And then there's a beast person. There's not only an it, there is a him. If I say the church, there's an it. But if I say the church, there's also a him because there's something that rules this. So he rises up having seven heads. Seven could be a universality of seven continents, or it could speak of all Gentile kingdoms that have been on this world. They number seven. It started with Egypt, then Assyria, then Babylon, then Persia, then Greco Macedon, then Rome, then revived Rome. This could be talking about all Gentile kingdoms collectively. And all of these things will be present in the last day. Or it could be talking about seven geographic areas. The Antichrist will rule the world somehow. You can't just sit at a switch with a remote control and govern everybody. You have to have geographic areas that are under the control and under the sway of this personality. Some have called the largest computer that had ever been created the beast. We have larger computers now that are even more compact. But the beast system is a, definitely is a computerized technology system. AI. And AI now far eclipses anything. The speed of just a search engine. Type in a word and if you're on a laptop, underneath that word it will say something like 770,000 entries mm -hmm. in 2.2 <laughs> seconds or whatever. Wow, that's fast. You might find one that will say several million in one second or whatever. That's just a big search engine with a powerful computer, Google or whoever could pull off. AI eclipses anything we have right now at the speed of the light. I mean, it's just amazing. And getting faster every day. When you argue with unbelievers who say you're making this all up, then you start talking about the capacity of AI and the power of AI. Yeah, well, sure, if it was misused, sure, this could happen real easily. There's nobody that will argue with you on that. 
Everybody on the planet today that has a cell phone in their hand knows that everything could go real bad real easily. But even at that, when you start assuming nefarious opposing states and countries like China or whatever, this last war is not going to require any boots on the ground. The war that brings a one world order into order. The problems that Boeing has been having recently are mechanical problems. But could it be possible that there's also some testing going on right now by China and different entities like that to see what they can get away with? Some of the blackouts and different things that you see going on, it starts to make you wonder, are we being tested here and there? Power outages and so forth. So COVID, was COVID wasn't COVID exactly a test, to, but that was a United States in conjunction with China test to see what can happen. The next test is not going to be pleasant, whether it is a, a nuclear bomb exploded pulse, uh, electronic pulse, EMP exploded in the skies that could knock out power grids all over the globe, but I don't think it's going to require that. All you have to do is get into the right code and get into the right systems and you can wreak havoc that would be unbearable. So all of that is to say that we are obviously nearing whether now, 10 years from now, 50 years from now, and I hate to say that with guys like Ryan, like Rain, because you want to, do I not have a future like you had a future? Sure, everybody has a future in Christ, amen. He's coming back and set up a kingdom. Everything that you've ever created will go bad. If you create a gun, a gun will go bad in the wrong hands. If you create a slingshot, it'll go wrong in the wrong hands. If you create a nuclear bomb, it will go wrong in the wrong hands. If you create internet, sure, it will go wrong in the wrong hands. If you create a printing press, it'll go wrong in the wrong hands. Anything that is created and any technology that advances has its potential for misuse.